Test, test. Ryan, how's the sound? We're not, we're not quite ready yet. Can you hear the sound on this? Is this on? Good? Okay. We're going to give it just another minute until... streaming this tonight. So first and foremost, thank you for being here. Uh, obviously a really important topic in our community and which is why we wanted to put tonight together. And as you walked in, you saw a whole bunch of agencies and partners, which we'll talk about here later. Uh, my name is Neil Musser. I am the director of safety and security for the Ellensburg School District. And I'm also a vice principal at the high school. And let me talk a little bit about format tonight. Uh, with us are representatives from the Ellensburg Police Department as well. Uh, Corp or Sergeant Cameron Clayson, who's going to be co-presenting with us. And Detective John Bean is also going to be presenting. And then also with us, Captain Jim Weed is here as well. And our school resource officer, uh, Stephanie Druck-Tennis, is here. And she's in all of our schools every day, too. So together, us and Ellsworth Police Department will be sharing the information tonight. At the conclusion of our presentation, we're going to ask all of those folks who are here from different agencies, uh, representing those agencies to come up. They're gonna in introduce themselves and tell a little bit about what they do and how they support uh, this effort with opioid overdose uh, education, prevention, and that kind of stuff. So let's get started. So we're gonna take a little, just a few minutes to talk about what are opioids, how they work in the body, uh, and a little bit about overdose, and then we're going to switch over to Ellensburg Police when I'm done, and they're going to talk about uh, some trends and what they're seeing in the community. So some of you may know some of this stuff, but for those that don't, uh, opioids are both synthetic and non-synthetic narcotics. Uh, the non-synthetic ones are derived from the poppy plant. They are prescribed for really severe, usually uh, chronic pain. They're really, really powerful narcotics. And some of the names you might recognize, uh, heroin, oxycodone, hydrocodone, hydromorphone, uh, and then partly what brings us here tonight, uh, one of those things is fentanyl. Uh, what we're seeing is counterfeit pills, so not, not legal pills, not pills that come from a pharmacy, but counterfeit pills being manufactured with a variety of different active and inactive ingredients, and often what we're seeing is laced with Fentanyl, and fentanyl is what we're seeing contribute to the overdose deaths that we've had in our community. If you think of morphine, and morphine is a really, really powerful narcotic, fentanyl is 80 to 100 times more powerful than morphine. Really, really, really powerful. 
And then we're not going to spend a ton of time talking about carfentanil, but carfentanil uh, is an elephant tranquilizer, and it's even a hundred times more powerful than fentanyl. So uh, luckily not seeing that, but it's out there. How do opioids work? They bind to specific receptors in the body, in the brain, in the spinal cord, and they create a high. So when a user, when somebody takes uh, an opioid, whether it's prescribed or not, it can sometimes create a feeling of euphoria or high. This same receptor that binds can also start to uh, make the person feel drowsy, sedated. It can also have other side effects, nausea, constipation, and so on. And opioids, of course, can be highly addictive. That's why they're highly regulated. And that's partly why we're seeing this huge influx of counterfeit pills and counterfeit drugs because it's such a highly regulated industry and it creates such an intense high. It also lowers the breathing and can slow or stop your heart from working. And the way that we see it used is really any way. It can be ingested, swallowed, smoked, snorted, uh, injected, just about any way that a person could deliver it into their body, that's how it's used. These are just some pictures of some of the counterfeit pills. And the reason that we wanted to bring this up is, and there's a, there's a sheet out there in the back. Um, the counterfeit pills, they're getting, and hopefully you guys will talk more about this too, I think they will. The counterfeit pill manufacturers are getting really, really good at making the counterfeit stuff look just like the real stuff. And so if you uh, are somebody who purchases uh, what you think is uh, maybe a, a bona fide genuine pill, but you didn't get a prescription for it, it's going to look very much similar to uh, the real thing. And that's what makes, partly what makes this so dangerous is there's this false sense of security about the use of this stuff. Uh, on the top here, I don't know if my little pointer works, uh, that's a real oxycodone tab, 30. That's the counterfeit. They look almost identical. And the technology has really, really um, grown, I would say, in the past few years to make it look so real. Uh, these middle ones uh, are Adderall and these are Xanax. And all of these are being used in some degree and being laced with fentanyl. What EPD will tell you is that by and large what we're seeing the bulk of here are the blues, uh, the counterfeit blues, which are laced with fentanyl and then creating the overdose. Don't need to get into a ton of detail on where it's coming from, but a lot of these labs, a lot of the uh, precursors, so the ingredients for these pills are being manufactured and then brought in from China, from Mexico, from Germany, from India, lots of different places. Uh, we talked about a little bit about those pill press advances. Again, what we're seeing here is blues um, or M30s or 30s. Those are kind of the street names for some of these. Uh, this is this, one of the scariest parts. And I think this has even grown a little bit now with the new DEA material. Over 25%, so one in four of these pills that are tested, once they're seized, can contain a lethal amount of fentanyl. One in four. So that's a game of roulette. If you've purchased, you know, somebody has purchased these pills uh, with the intention of uh, getting high, one in four could contain a lethal dose of fentanyl, do contain a lethal dose of fentanyl. Um, synthetic opioids, mainly fentanyl, is accounting for 80% of all opioid overdose deaths. So by and large, the deaths, overdose deaths that come from synthetic opioids come from fentanyl. <clears throat> so what does overdose look like? It can occur uh, over quite a few hours. Uh, what starts to happen is the uh, heart rate starts to slow down, the breathing starts to slow down, pupils start to get super pinpointed, the person can appear really, really drowsy. Um, if it's, some of you may have heard the term being on the nod. It's almost like they fall asleep and then they wake up and then they fall asleep and then they wake up. That's a, a really good indicator that they may be under the influence or may have a powerful narcotic in their system. Eventually what happens or can happen is the opioid receptors uh, bind and they become so full in the body that it just slows the heart enough to stop it. 
Uh, and that's when the respiratory depression happens and that's when the overdose happens. They can also, from appearance, look super pale, clammy, um, be cyanotic, their fingertips, their lips may turn blue because of a lack of oxygenated blood in their system and to their extremities. The good news is, uh, some of the good news is, we do have available, and we carry it at, uh, certainly at Ellensburg High School and at uh, Morgan Middle School, we have doses available of an opioid reversal medication called naloxone. And it's available to us uh, in the form of a nasal uh, application called Narcan. It's really pretty effective with opioid reversal uh, if somebody is overdosing. So what it does, what this medication does, is it attaches to those same receptors and it blocks the opioid from acting in the body. Uh, it doesn't, however, um, if, if somebody is revived by using Narcan, it doesn't mean that it's fixed, they still need to go to the hospital. So it's, it, if, somebody, if somebody has overdosed, somebody administers naloxone or Narcan, they still need to go to the hospital because once that opioid reversal medication wears off, there's still the same amount of, or could be the same amount of narcotic in their system and they could revert back and still experience more overdose symptoms. So the also, uh, another good, really good news about Narcan is uh, if somebody has overdosed on a different substance, alcohol or another drug, for example, and Narcan is administered, it's not going to hurt them. So it's really a pretty, um, really safe medication to administer, which is why we're allowed to carry it and administer it in schools. We have the nasal version, it's also injectable. Um, and we have, again, have these supplied in our health rooms at both schools and actually at our um, alternative school. So what can we do as community members, as parents, as educators? We need to recognize what overdose symptoms look like. Um, I would encourage you to go out on the internet and take two minutes and type in uh, Narcan administration, type in op opioid overdose symptoms, educate yourself just a little bit more on the topic, and uh, that way you can see what it looks like. And I know that Community Health, for example, is here and they can hook us, hook you up with uh, doses of Narcan and I want that everybody to hear that, both on the live stream and here in the audience, that Narcan is available. And it shouldn't cost you um, hardly anything to get it. But it's a really good thing to have to save a life. Uh, if you do recognize, if you know what the symptoms look like, we ask that, of course, we want to um, encourage you to call 911. Again, just because Narcan is administered does not mean that a person would then once the Narcan is worn off, it doesn't mean that they won't fall back into those overdose symptoms. So 911 always has to be called in an overdose situation. What we tell uh, folks is in the schools is call administrators, um, call using a cell phone, send a student down, get a hold of us so that we can help, and then administer the Narcan. There is uh, no liability for administering Narcan. It's covered under the Good Samaritan law. So you trying to help someone or us trying to help someone, we're covered by doing that, which is really, really great for us. That means we can act in good faith and hopefully save somebody in the process. Uh, and also, a person can't be charged with drug possession. Let's say somebody was at a party and their friend overdosed and they went to save them. Some, there's been a, um, a hesitancy, I think, in some times in some places where they don't want to make the phone call to 911 and have law enforcement show up because they don't want to be busted. Uh, they don't want to be seen as being in possession of a drug that they shouldn't have. The person cannot be charged in that case. So we just want people to know, and, and uh, Ellensburg Police can talk more about that too, but we just want people to know that we want to get people to help uh, and not worry about the other stuff because getting people help and saving lives is what we want to do. I'm going to invite... Uh, Sergeant Clayson up, and Ellsberg Police is going to talk just a little bit about some of the trends that they're seeing right now. All right, thanks, Neil. I appreciate everyone being here tonight. And uh, as you said, my name is Cameron Clayson. I'm uh, currently the detective sergeant for the Ellsberg Police Department. And uh, I've been doing it for about 22 years now, so I've had a little bit of experience in, in this area. Thank you. 
so what we're going to talk about, you know, kind of about the drug trends that I've seen over my career. And we all can kind of remember that Faces of Meth campaign that they had going out. It was a really good campaign. It had the, you know, hey, here's a picture of a person before they were using meth, and here's a picture of them now after they've been using meth. It was, you know, I would say a pretty effective campaign. I think it was pretty effective for our youth because, well, nobody wants to look like that, right? So they said, hey, we're not going to use meth. However, we didn't have a lot of education on other drugs that were out there. So in about 2008, 2008 to 2010, I was part um, of our anti-crime team that was you know, primarily focused on drugs. We started seeing this influx of people starting to use this Oxycontin. So they were buying these pills and you know, essentially pharmacies were over, you know, might have been over-prescribing. They were doing these, uh, you know, other states bringing these pills in. They were pretty expensive. So they were, you know, depending on the milligrams, there was 30 milligram pills, 60 milligram pills. It was about a dollar a milligram. So a pill could cost, you know, we see, saw it up to 60 bucks a pill to $80 a pill. Some people were using up to eight pills. So it was a very expensive habit. Well, that problem kept, kept happening. The manufacturer realized we need to do something about this. So they reformulated it to make it to where it wasn't um, as likely to be abused. Well, when that happened, and those started to get a little more uh, harder to get, people switched to heroin because that's all that was, was just heroin and a pill. So that's when we started seeing that transition to heroin. It was cheaper. You can get it on the street. Um, they really stopped being able to get that, that oxy that they could, could uh, um, abuse. Go from heroin, and meanwhile, prescription drugs around that time were, were killing people as well. You know, I mean, we have people that were taking them legally, they had prescriptions, maybe started, you know, had an addiction problem to them, um, they, their pain tolerance got built up and they were using more and more, or they were abusing them. And so back then they were saying uh, prescription drug abuse was killing more than heroin, meth, and cocaine combined. So that's kind of a little, you know, most people don't realize that, but it's pretty dangerous as well. Um, so I'll have John Bean come up here. John Bean is a member of our uh, anti-crime team, and they primarily uh, handle drug investigations. So he's going to talk about some of the trends he saw. But essentially what we saw is that from that heroin, now people started getting into that fentanyl. Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming tonight. I'm going to talk a little bit about how we discovered here in the city uh, that fentanyl had uh, come on board. Yeah, we knew that it was around for some time. We started receiving some training and uh, preparing the best we could for its arrival. So in 2016, uh, one of our patrol officers received a call that uh, from a citizen that they had observed what they thought was a drug deal go down in plain sight. Uh, the officer located the individuals involved, and uh, during that investigation, they found uh, inside the vehicle a piece of crushed foil with a substance inside that they believed was heroin. It was sent off to the Washington State Patrol Crime Lab, and they determined that it contained fentanyl. Uh, the crime lab said at that time that it was the first uh, sample that they had received uh, where fentanyl had been smoked off foil. Then it kind of went uh, silent for a while until 2017. I was involved in that investigation. Uh, patrols got called to an overdose, and uh, in which case they had to perform CPR. Um, the patient had uh, was using U47700, uh, which I believe uh, uh, Neil spoke about earlier. It's a very powerful opioid uh, that the um, subject had obtained from overseas, the dark web. Then again, kind of goes silent until 2020. That's when uh, myself and my partner, Detective Holmes, started hearing about uh, the counterfeit oxycodone pills, the blues, coming into the city. 
But we didn't, weren't receiving enough information that we could really take action. Uh, it was more information pre preparing for its coming. And uh, then in 2021, uh, it really started becoming prevalent. The information we we're hearing was the majority of the dealers uh, within the city, actually within the county, uh, weren't only selling uh, black tar heroin or methamphetamine, but they're also selling the counterfeit oxycodone blue pills containing fentanyl. Uh, so we started actively seeking out those, those individuals that were selling the, the fentanyl pills. And the way we do that is we utilize uh, confidential informants uh, to purchase from these individuals that they name as selling the fentanyl pills. Uh, so far in 2021, uh, I would say we've made five arrests um, on uh, dealers within uh, the city and with, throughout the county that are uh, partaking in the sale of the uh, fentanyl pills. Uh, some of those dealers were also selling other drugs in combination, uh, black tar heroin and methamphetamine. Um, so between 20, 2020 and 21, or, or present time, uh, anti-crime units made 32 drug-related arrests. Uh, currently, fentanyl uh, is the drug of choice. That is the most prevalent. That is what uh, the majority, if not all of our informants at the time, is uh, to some extent the only thing that they can buy. Uh, the forms that's coming in, the only thing we're seeing right now are the counterfeit oxycodones marked M30 blue pills. We are receiving information that uh, they're also um, coming in different forms. It's being put into the cocaine, it's being put into methamphetamine, it's being put into the black tar heroin. Uh, Zani, or Zani bar Xanax, um, that's another uh, pill that we're, we're hearing is, is being sold counterfeit containing fentanyl, but we haven't come across those uh, to this point. Uh, so kind of a difference here, 2020 to 2021, you can see uh, for delivery of controlled substance investigations, uh, in 2020, we had seven uh, methamphetamine investigations, um, eight heroin, that's black tar heroin, and then uh, in 21, we had methamphetamine six. So those are pretty much in line, pretty consistent. Hasn't gone away, even though we're really not hearing as much information on that. Uh, black tar heroin, zero. So uh, the black tar heroin's a lot, it's a lot more expensive for uh, the cartels and, and other people higher up to move the black tar heroin to produce it. Um, and then we've had six, six fentanyl. So uh, I believe that's five, five arrests to date on that. And uh, we're continuing to seek out uh, more individuals who are involved in the sales of that. And uh, one cocaine investigation. Uh, this is kind of going to outline uh, this is more or less what we're paying and what we're hearing from informants that they're paying, what they're using. Uh, you know, the, it says the average user smokes one to 10 pills per day, depending on potency and, and tolerance of the individual. You know, that's, that's a, a very wide range, right? The, the individual doesn't really know what they're receiving. Some people tell us that they're receiving very consistent pills, but it only takes one. And the, uh, the presses that are doing, they're, they're becoming uh, more advanced. It's illegal to have a pill press uh, um, in the United States unless you're a pharmaceutical company. So they're getting those overseas to, to do the pressing. But uh, one to 10 pills per day, I would say on average, uh, it's probably, probably like five. And some of them, if they're going to be very potent, those are the ones that are going to have that lethal dose in them. And I believe the number now that the DEA uh, with the testing uh, on 
pills containing fentanyl that it's 48% contain a lethal dose. Uh, average cost of eight to 12 dollars per pill, highest 15. We've received information, people selling them up to 30. Uh, which is significantly cheaper, black tar heroin, that's gonna go for uh, about $20 a point, a point's a tenth of a gram, so you're looking at uh, $200 a, a, a gram, so that's pretty spendy compared to the uh, fentanyl pill. Uh, we're seeing them in greater uh, quantities um, compared to the black tar heroin. Most of the dealers uh, that we saw moving the black tar heroin uh, last year uh, were probably an ounce or less. We're hearing and hearing uh, people and seeing uh, photographs of people uh, 100 to maybe 3,000 pills. So we know that that's a good solid at least 3,000 chances that somebody's going to receive a lethal dose. Um, yeah, number of, I mentioned the number of individuals dealing fentanyl has increased. It's almost all the, all the dealers that we knew of uh, that were just strictly methamphetamine, maybe at one time or now, uh, also selling the blues. And where it's coming from. All the information that we receive, uh, the, I would say the, the Lower Valley, uh, Yakima, we've received information of the, the Mattawa area and uh, an increasing influence from Western Washington. So that's probably uh, the most dominant is Western Washington at this point with the information that we've received. A uh, picture here of some paraphernalia. That's a piece of foil. Uh, the black that you see on there looks like somebody ran a Sharpie across. That's from, uh, they'll place the heroin on there, the, the blue pill or the black tar heroin. Uh, they'll let, heat that up from underneath with the, uh, with the lighter, and it kind of moves around the foil, and that creates that black mark. Hollow uh, tube, that's just a, like a pen, like a writing pen, and they'll typically take the guts out of it, cut it in half, and that's what they use to kind of, you know, inhale those fumes. So that's pretty common when, you, when we see... Uh, paraphernalia for this, this type of case, that's what we're going to see. And that's just an example, that's kind of the tube, they're, you know, they're inhaling the fumes there uh, and lighten it from the bottom. I think that's about it. All right, uh, back to Detective Sergeant Quayson. All right. Thanks, John. So, April... That's kind of when uh, our, our drug detectives kind of seen uh, that, uh, hey, we're starting to see a lot more, a lot more influx of, this, of these pills. And John, he's been doing it for about six years in the, in the drug world. And he's very good, and both him and his partner are recognizing, like, hey, this is starting to get out of control. We really just need to focus on that. So they started to kind of focus in on that. And... Uh, we recognize as a department that we need to start maybe doing some education as well. So that's when we start, hopefully you guys are all part of our Facebook uh, friends, and that's when we started kind of pushing out some of our information on drug abuse, what we're seeing, and you know, maybe some resources of if, you, if you need some help, what to do. And then we you know, are creating those partnerships. One of the things that we started uh, earlier this year, maybe it was a little bit into or last year, is partnership with Dave Douglas and you know, starting to get some resource pamphlets out so when we run into people that are, are having addiction issues, we can hand out these programs, here's some phone numbers for you, and just trying to hit it from all avenues. Because we recognize you know, our job as law enforcement doesn't always work, right? And we could all, I would love to stand up here and say the war on drugs is working really well, um, but we can all sit here and say that it's not. However, you know, if we can create these partnerships and hit it from different angles, because sometimes it does work, the law enforcement realm does work, but sometimes it doesn't. But sometimes maybe, you know, just pushing that um, recovery or, you know, that uh, uh, rehabilitation, maybe that'll work for someone. So we started creating these partnerships, you know, and hoping that, hey, we're going to try to combat this as a, as a community because we, we all care and we all want to help these people. So May, that's kind of when they started making their controlled purchases. 
building their cases, leading to, leading to some rest for those people that are uh, selling the fentanyl pills. May 3rd, that's when we had our first overdose death for fentanyl. May 15th, we got our second, and we've had four since then. So it's, it's really hit our community hard. That's part of the reason we're doing this. And we're, we're hoping that, you know, just doing this will help, help some people too. Uh, Neil mentioned Narcan. Uh, we're fortunate our department has uh, supplied that. You know, they give each, each car has fentanyl. Uh, or I'm sorry, Narcan. Yeah, that would be bad if we had fentanyl. Uh, real smooth. All right, so anyway. They, they gave us Narcan, and uh, each car has them. I carry it. I mean, most of our detectives carry it on their person because we are kind of dealing in that drug world. So here's kind of showing just what our, uh, our uses are. Um, and you can just kind of see an increase. Uh, that, that top kind of orange is 2019. The, the middle kind of blue is 2020, and 2021 is that light blue. So overdoses, we've had 32. So you can just kind of see that steady increase. We've had six Narcan deployments this year. Four of them were saves. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, two were not, but we're, we're happy that, that we were able to save at least four people's lives this year with that. We've had some uh, challenges for, for this year for law enforcement. Law enforcement is changing. You know, like I said, been doing it for a while, and now we're, we have some, 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 uh, some law changes. So we're going to have to adapt to that. And there's probably, you know, people that are on one side or the other. And in the end, it really doesn't matter for me because this is what, how I have to enforce laws. So it's changed for me. We're going to adapt. So February 25th is when the Supreme Court basically declared that felony drug possession law was unconstitutional. Immediately, they halted all arrests for any felony amount. That would include if you had a fentanyl pill, cocaine, heroin, all that. That's all felony. Back then was felony level drugs. And so that's halted that. So May 13th, the governor, he basically uh, signed this, uh, this bill into effect where essentially they're kind of changing the tactic. So they're going to give people resources. So if we catch someone on the, on the street and they have some drugs on them, we'll still confiscate those drugs, but we'll give them resources. And then we'll continue to give them resources. After, uh, I think it's the fourth or fifth time, uh, then they'll they can get a gross misdemeanor ticket for that. And then once they go to court, they'll be provided, you know, a chance for resources as well. So it's been a, a pretty big flip of, you know, how we're going to combat this. So we're going to go more of the uh, 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 rehabilitation way. One of the tools that we still have is our controlled substance homicide. So if you give someone else a drug, if it's illegal or it's a scheduled drug, prescription, and they die, that's where we can arrest you for a controlled substance homicide. And, you know, sometimes people get hung up on the delivery because they think, well, that person's not a drug dealer. The delivery essentially is called the transfer of substance from one person to another, whether it was sold to them or it was given. So if you give it to them and they, and they pass away from what you did, you can be held accountable for that. Recently, we've had three arrests for that. We have some investigations still ongoing. So uh, we're, you know, very, we're hoping to, to get some arrests out of that as well. And uh, one of the things our department did, those investigations are pretty uh, time consuming. So we have, you know, two de drug detectives, two general detectives. The two general detectives, for the most part, handle these investigations. They're very time consuming. There's a lot of information involved, a lot of people to interview. So our department added an additional person to our detectives unit, just temporary, just to kind of help balance and help start taking those other cases that should that they can't wait. We still have the delivery of controlled substance statute. Uh, basically, you know, you, you you can't give anyone anyone drugs, so it's pretty self-explanatory. So that's another way, and that's kind of what those uh, detective being and detective homes, that's what they focus on. Criminal justice system, essentially what we're talking about here, you know, how, how this works. What do, we, what do we do? Obviously, we do our initial investigation. We develop probable cause for an arrest. So we arrest this person, and we book them. We've had just a short time here. Obviously, the COVID world's changed everything. So there's been 
a couple short stints there where, you know, if the jail has a, a, an outbreak of COVID, they have booking restrictions where you can't bring anyone in for uh, a lot of reasons. You know, there are some reasons that they'll still allow someone to be booked, but sometimes we had to deal with that. And then the person goes to their uh, first court appearance. That's where they determine. The judge just says, yes, there is probable cause. I agree. The detectives had probable cause to arrest this person for either delivery or controlled substance homicide. And they'll determine whether or not there's going to be bail set or whether they can be released on personal recognizance. Recent cases, it just depends. You know, it's kind of a wide range. We've seen anywhere bail being set from $300 all the way up to $50,000. And um, on occasion, someone might be out on bail. They might have paid their bail. Um, they'll start dealing drugs again. And there's been multiple occasions where the drug detectives will have another informant who will start buying drugs off that person and then arrest them again. So we don't, you know, we hope that when we do arrest you that the, the ultimate goal is for you to get off drugs, stop selling drugs, and hopefully get into some recovery to where you can get off it. But if we have to arrest you again, we'll do that too. We work closely with our prosecutor on these cases, you know, especially the controlled substance homicide. There's a lot of, um, you know, a lot of correspondence back and forth on, hey, this is where the case is. You know, do we have probable cause or not? We feel like we do. The prosecutor can agree. And ultimately, at the very end of the day, we may have developed probable cause, but then that person obviously is innocent until proven guilty. So they have to go to court, and it's ultimately it's up to the judge or the jury to decide whether or not they're guilty of those, those uh, crimes. Um, talk about success stories. So... You know, when someone gets arrested for, these, for a crime like this, they have, they, they're going to get multiple opportunities for some resources. And, you know, one of the things that our prosecutor's office has is drug court. I know there's been a lot of success cases with that, that someone gets charged, you know, with maybe a possession case. They go to drug court, might have to go to rehab. They have some accountability there where they might have to have, you know, where they um, have to get drug tested and things like that. And so they've had some success with that. At jail, you know, they offer resources there as well. So when someone, you know, if they want to talk to a counselor or some kind of uh, recovery, they, they have options there. Sometimes probation for people, that's what helps them, you know, because they're held accountable. Again, they, they have drug tests and they have to um, test to make sure they're not using drugs. And so for sometimes people, it works for them for that. And sometimes it's, you know, it is the law enforcement realm where they get arrested and then they get arrested again, and then they get arrested again, and they, they're tired of living that life. And, you know, hopefully by this time they've had a lot of resources, and maybe that seed's been planted, that they, there's some uh, rehabilitation out there, but sometimes it's just they are, are done with being arrested, and they don't want to do that again. And I've, you know, we've had multiple times where we've had people come up to us and thank us because we've arrested them, and especially even our, our drug detectives where they say, man, you arrested me because I was dealing drugs and thank you because you saved my life because I decided I didn't want to live that life anymore. Now, I wish that was 100%. I wish that every person that was arrested would stop doing it, um, but that's just not the case. So that's part of the reason we have these partnerships, you know, because sometimes rehabilitation is going to be the way. So here... Uh, here's some of uh, our community partners. Uh, unfortunately, I'm sorry we didn't have all the phone numbers, but... There are some phone numbers up there if you want to snap a photo of that, if you want to talk about uh, maybe some treatment options. If you know somebody that could use that number, give them a call because we, we want people to get help. And uh, so that's pretty much the slides that I have. I'll have Neil kind of explain uh, what we're going to do from here. And thanks again for coming. Sergeant Clayson, thank you. Um, Detective Bean, thank you. So our goal tonight is twofold. Obviously, the first part is for us uh, here to provide you information, education, a little bit about what are opioids, uh, what are we seeing as far as overdose, uh, what is EPD dealing with, and how are we responding uh, both at the school district and from the police department perspective. The second goal for tonight uh, is we have a quite a wide range of uh, partners that have joined us tonight that are in support of this goal and, and these missions. And so what we'd like to do 
is invite, and I, and I don't know if I was able to get all of these um, agencies up here on our slide, <clears throat> but if you are an agency that is here, what I'd like you to do is come up and line up down here. We're gonna give the microphone to each person, have them introduce their, um, themselves and their organization, and just maybe a, a brief uh, one or two sentences about why they're here. Once, come on up, yep. Once they are done, we're going to adjourn this part and move out into the commons, the cafeteria, and if you have questions of any of these people, that's when uh, we would ask you to ask them. So, Um, maybe I'll just pass the lapel down. Uh, this is the house I spend all the time in this house. Would um, say your name, the agency, organization that you're with, and a brief description of what services you would provide, and I'm going to take my lapel mic off as well. I'm Bert Jelly with Kittitas Valley Fire and Rescue. Um, we're the EMS agency for about two-thirds of Kittitas County. Uh, we are seeing an increase. We've been tracking overdoses very closely since 2013. Um, most of our paramedics and firefighters have kids, brothers, sisters, parents um, that experience these issues, and it is heartbreaking to go to an overdose and understand that that naloxone sort of um, temporary uh, fix for the overdose has to be delivered in a very short window of time. And if you're outside that four to six to 10 minute window, it doesn't work. Um, and so from our perspective, you know, the community efforts and getting people so that we don't, do not come back and repeat. And, and oftentimes we're going to the same patients who are repeating the overdose. And we know that, you know, it's a matter of time before either a change is made or something really bad happens. And again, um, you know, I've, in my career, I've been doing this for 34 years. I've had to go to too many parents and tell them their kids are dead. So that's my message. My name is Jay McDonald. I am here representing KVH. KVH has numerous providers that uh, provide uh, medication-assisted treatment services, uh, essentially prescribing medications for the treatment of substance use disorders or addiction. Um, we also have a provider, Dr. Asriel, who his only thing that he does is uh, medication-assisted treatment. Um, for a variety of different uh, substance use disorders, you know, especially opioid use disorder. So if you have any questions about that, feel free to give me a call. Um, so we are primarily located in the Cleellum office. The number is 674-5331, um, but we also operate um, out of the Ellensburg office as well. So that's KVH Family Medicine Cleellum and KVH Family Medicine Ellensburg. Hi, my name is Pam Tuggle Niles, and I'm the community liaison for Community Health of Central Washington for our Connect program. We're very similar to KVH as far as uh, offering medication assisted treatment for opioid use disorder. Our program is a clinical based program, so we see patients in primary care setting. And um, we also involve them with behavioral health services. And um, if they are a patient, uh, they become a patient of community health and they also have access to our dental services and other primary care services. So um, I'm also out in the lobby and um, please feel free to stop by and ask any questions. Brian. Um, I'm Melissa Denner. I, I think I put this on the slide because there's a new family here who have lost people. Um, but I'm holding you in my heart. Um, okay, so I work for Merit Resource Services here in Ellensburg. Um, we are a behavioral health. Um, we provide primary substance use disorder treatment, cognitive behavioral treatment, and mental health services. Um, I'm a duly credentialed clinician, so I do mental health, 
and substance use disorder. Um, so I run the mental health program for Merit, and um, we provide lots of services, individual counseling, group, group therapy for substance use disorder. We have a co-occurring track for people who both have co-occurring um, mental health and substance use issues, as well as just people with substance use issues that could benefit from skills. Um, we're very passionate about recovery. We're a 12-step based program. We're very involved in the community, and um, we're definitely here to help. Thank you, Thank you all for all you guys coming tonight. Um, my name is Mike Lament. I'm the clinical supervisor over at Merritt. Um, Melissa pretty much touched on everything that we do there, but um, we're up here with a lot of these uh, commu these uh, community organizations that we all we all meet on a, on a regular basis, and um, we're here to help and support in any way we can. Boy, <laughs> um, my name is Sierra Rogers, um, and this is I'm Rachel Williams, and we work for Hope Source. Um, I'm also contracted with the um, Washington State Department. Um, I'll talk a little bit briefly over like what services we offer and I'll let Rachel take over for the brief part. Um, but we both run the YHDB program, which we specialize in housing instability um, and services for youth ages 12 to 24 years old. And we're seeing a lot of these um, overdose issues, opioid crises in our youth who come in for services. So we make it... Um, something to do the referrals. We also have a DOJ program, I think was mentioned, where our general pop who is in the jails can have communication even if they're incarcerated with a case manager to set up um, services for housing, um, for referrals to merit, um, and other things like that. We have grant money to help um, lead them to self-sufficiency. Um, and then Rachel really focuses with me um, on the youth part. And I'll let you explain that. Yeah, so I am a client advocate, so I will do all of our case management for our youth that come in. So we run a transitional housing unit, um, rehousing unit, and also general support services. So we can connect um, youth with mental health um, and even basic things like food and clothing as well as helping them with rent. So we really want to help stabilize um, all of our youth from all different angles um, between the case management and all of the other resources that we provide for them. Have a table as well. So if you have questions about our resources for like housing or how we work or how we make our referrals or how we help youth who may be more high barrier with struggling with drug addiction issues and how it relates to families, community, everything, please come chat with us and we'd love to share with you tonight. Hi, my name is Joyce Whitehall and I'm also here with Shelby Schreier. So we are part of um, the Duval Court, and a lot of what we do is, um, of course, we do kids come in and we do we deal a lot with the probation. But besides dealing with probation, we also uh, really have a focus on helping families and um, youth in our community to be able to integrate back into the community and be successful. Um, one of the programs that we offer through probation is the at-risk youth petition, and that is really to help families um, kind, of, kind of come to us, find resources and what they need in order to um, help their youth, and then as well as have the court kind of be involved to kind of take a little bit more control over the situation and what is going around them. We do work a lot with um, the partners here, and we make referrals as well as um, to see what exactly we need in order to kind of get, give them the best help and assistance through this, um, through hard times. Hi, my name is Lauren Wickerath. I'm here with the Kittitas County Public Health Department. I'm working harm reduction with the health department, and my main job is to um, operate the syringe exchange, never share syringe service project that's here in Ellensburg and um, housed right in the courtyard of the 
First United Methodist Church, 210 North Ruby. Um, it's a, a fabulous spot because we have the clothing bank next door and we have um, NA meetings and um, it's just a, a very supportive environment for people to um, meet and utilize our services. We uh, are very fortunate to partner with some of the people up here. Pam Tuggle Miles, I get to see twice a week. We're open 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. And we have um, Pam and we have Comprehensive Healthcare who help man the syringe exchange and we provide uh, supplies to prevent the transmission of HIV and hepatitis C. That's our primary goal um, with, the, with the fentanyl and um, overdose upticks. We've a main job that I have spent a lot of time trying to secure our sources for Narcan and Naloxone and I've um, tried very hard to find ways to disperse that, and, and I have lots of, lots of ideas to share. So please join us in the back um, at our table, and we've got Kate Johnson, our Communicable Disease Director, and Nia Alfaro, a Health Promotion Specialist here also. We have a lot to share. My name is Tyler Douglas. Um, I'm a student assistant professional uh, through ESD 105. I'm stationed at Excel High School and I work with the Ellensburg High School and Morgan Middle School. Um, I'm somebody within the school that provides services for students who may struggle with substance use, um, have substance use related issues within their home, uh, family members might struggle with substance use, anything related in that area I can support students. Um, I uh, am contacted with students through referrals, disciplinary, uh, family, uh, anything of that sorts. I have flyers out there at the Healthy Youth Coalition table uh, for referrals for staff, students, um, and family members if anybody needs my services. Okay, so I've been listening and I heard the instructions one to two sentences, but I'm going to probably go about 12 to 15, so... <laughs> Uh, my name is David Douglas. I am the David Douglas that was on the screen. The partnership that we've started with the police department has been amazing. My role here tonight is to talk about the Kittitas County Recovery Community Organization that we are just now launching. This has been a goal of mine for several years and we now have a building and a space and we officially start. We have a calendar for you to take home with you tonight. We officially start programming in that space on Monday. And I just want to read just briefly the sole mission of the Recovery Community Organization is to mobilize resources within and outside the recovery community to increase the prevalence and quality of long-term recovery from substance use disorders. So our first big event is a week from tomorrow on this card here. We're going to have an open mic night. So 211 West 3rd, it's a little bit of a fundraiser, but don't worry if you don't want to give us money yet. Come and check us out. It's all about supporting our community members in recovery from substance use disorders. I'm just one bright shining example of what happens when we give access to our community members who have a substance use disorder and they can turn their lives around. Because of access to resources, I haven't had to use drugs or alcohol since March 25th of 2007. I'm an integral member of this community in all ways. I pay taxes, I own businesses, my wife and I own a home, I'm a college professor at Central Washington University. I'm not alone, and the goal of this recovery community organization is to show that bright, shiny light of recovery so it can get hope for others. I'm here with our program manager, Mariana, who didn't want to come up here, but I want to introduce her to you because she's also uh, a member of our board. We have a table out there. We have other board members here. Come and meet us. Thank you for letting me talk. I am going to introduce myself. I'm Mariana Shane. I'm the program director for the KCRCO. So I set up all these uh, fun events and hopefully get these resources out into the community for those members who need them or need to connect with other community members who are in recovery. I've got two years recovery and I'm really excited to be part of this group. Hello, I'm Jamie Walker. I'm a nurse practitioner at Comprehensive Healthcare. 
Um, we have several different services that we offer, and so there's lots of people that are going to talk today. Um, what I do is medication assistant treatment at Comprehensive, mainly Suboxone. Um, we have a walk-in opportunity Monday through Friday for people if they want to get started on Suboxone, they can walk into the office and we will get them started soon. I also provide um, mat services at the jail. Um, so that's what I do there. Um, here we go. Awesome. My name is Alicia. Um, I also work at Comprehensive with our Hub and Spoke program. I work to get people uh, with a opiate use disorder on medication assisted treatment. I work with Comprehensive, I work with KVH, and I work with Community Health. I'm also in the jail and at Syringe Exchange. That's what I do. <laughs> Hi, my name is Ariana. I am also with Comprehensive Healthcare. I run what's called the IDDT program, or Integrated Dual Disorder Treatment. And I specialize in co-occurring disorder, so a mental illness and a substance use disorder. Um, it's really a neat program. We especially serve people with a more severe mental health disorder, schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, but we really serve all people who are experiencing both of those illnesses. Um, and it's really awesome. I really appreciate the opportunity to do it. Awesome. My name is Chris Devellanu. I'm the Vice President for Comprehensive Healthcare. I spend the majority of my time baking cookies and populating spreadsheets. Uh, if you're seeing me, it's because I've failed to support these guys. This is, I oversee Kittitas County and Yakima County, and currently I'm the director of the methadone program in Yakima. I have 215 clients that are currently on methadone or suboxone. Um, we do our best to support treatment, and this is one of the proudest moments I have is to get to have people like this here. So, awesome. Hi, I'm Mackenzie Milden. I work with the services of the Test County, and I run the Cascade Prevention Coalition. We're specifically based in Upper Kittitas County, so we service anywhere from Salem all the way up to Ronald, or Easton, I'm sorry, all the way, all the way up there. Um, we run substance abuse prevention programs for youth, largely school-based, but also community-based. Um, we work with youth and families, um, but I get the fun job of this really sad topic because I get to be in on the ground doing prevention and hopefully stopping the problem before it starts. So I feel really lucky to work with our youth and do that. I'm Courtney Duran. I work for the Anchor School District. I'm the Alfred Health Abuse Coalition Coordinator. Um, I work with prevention, substance prevention and abuse, which is right in Elmer. Um, there's a variety of programs we support, um, like comparison classes, we support the social emotional curriculum in middle school, uh, elementary school, and pre-K. Um, we have a community survey right now um, that will help improve our programs that we implement in our community. So I have a table in the back, and if you would like to come see me and learn about our programs and um, take the survey, that would be greatly appreciated. <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, Melissa Weeman, and I'm also with the Ellensburg School District, and I'm the mental health and wellness uh, staff. Uh, I'm located at the high school, uh, serving both the high school students and um, the alternative programs students, and then I'm also at uh, Valley View Elementary. Um, I have a counterpart who's not here. Her name's uh, Abigail Hughes, and she's here at Morgan Middle School and the other elementary schools. Um, serving a wide range of students, um, and by trade, I'm a school social worker, so happy to be here. Hi, my name is Anna Wilson, and um, I work for the Ellensburg School District, and I help families uh, rem uh, in removing barriers so that they can attend the school district or any other resources that they might need for the families, and I'm glad to know these wonderful people and the wonderful resources that we have in our community. And I am located right now at the high school, but I will be moving soon to Ida Mason School. Thank you so much, all of you, for being here. Um, 
This is a, just a good example of the resources that we have here and the support we have in our community. So at this time, if you have um, questions of these individual folks, all of them will be available out in the Commons area. And if they represent an agency uh, that you heard that you wanted specific information about, you're welcome to go and take part in that. Could we please give a big round of applause for Elmsburg Police Department? <laughs>